Good morning and welcome. We thank you for joining in today. We're so glad that you've tuned in. This is week number 11 of a teaching series on the book of Galatians, and we are calling this series Galatians, the Gospel of Grace. Our text today will be found in Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 18. So follow along in your Bibles in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. You know, in the old days of the Wild West, when two people got into a heated fight about something, they sometimes had duels. Now, just picture in your mind's eye two dusty cowboys who are walking towards each other down Main Street, and it's high noon, and they face each other from about a distance of ten paces. And the streets are lined with curious uh, onlookers waiting to see which one of the men is going to be quicker on the draw while those with more sense are taking cover and shutting up their businesses. Then without warning, one man quickly draws his gun from his holster. He has the other man dead to rights as he fires off a round. But he misses. And after the shock of having a bullet narrowly blow by his head, the other man carefully takes aim and sends the first cowboy to meet his maker. Now, the man who won the duel wasn't the man who was the quickest, but the one who knew how to aim. You see, it doesn't matter how fast you fire off your shot. If you don't know how to aim, you're going to lose. Today I want to talk to us about another kind of duel. I want to talk about uh, a showdown for our souls. This is a duel that I am sure that every one of you has experienced in your life. Paul talks about this inner spiritual duel in this passage that we're going to be focusing on in verse uh, uh, 16 of Galatians chapter 5. Let's read together. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Now, this is one of the most important passages on the Christian life in the entire New Testament. It answers a question that all of us have asked at one time or another. Why is it taking me so long to get better? You know, we've all wondered that, haven't we? Well, I thought by now I wouldn't lose my temper so much with anger. Why is it taking me so long to get better? Or, I'm still tempted by sin. Why is it taking me so long to get better? Now, when it comes to temptation, I'm not sure you're ever going to be free of that one until you <laughs> the gates click behind you in heaven. But some folks, that's what their mind thinks about. Um, you have other folks who says, well, I go to church every Sunday, but I still have a lot of doubts. Why is it taking me so long to get better? Or, I thought I'd be a better person by now, but I've got so many bad habits. Why is it taking me so long to get better? Or, I'm a bitter person, even though I cover it up most of the time. Why is it taking me so long to get better? And many of us wish that we had an answer to that question. And we might assume that upon conversation, we would rapidly sprout wings and fly to heaven. You know, we think that once, once we are converted, that we're automatically made perfect. But it doesn't happen that way. 
God has ordained that even though we are being made like Jesus, it only happens a little bit at a time. And sometimes that phrase, little bit, seems little bit indeed. Now, part of our problem stems from our misunderstanding of what we call sanctification. You know, some folks think that once they get sanctified, then they no longer need to worry about sin or temptation. Well, once I get sanctified, the devil will have to leave me alone. Not true. Now, I believe in a second definite work of grace in the life of a believer, but I also believe in a gradual process of sanctification. Now, allow me to to illustrate it this way. Part of our prophetic interpretation of Old Testament scripture helps us understand that the promised land, Canaan, was a type or a shadow, a symbol, if you will, of the sanctified life. Now, there was a definite moment when Old Testament Israel crossed the Jordan River and entered into Canaan. They left the wilderness and crossed over into Canaan. And that crossing is symbolic of what happens when a believer moves to deeper salvation experience that we call sanctification. It is a definite crisis moment in the life of a believer. However, once Israel achieved the goal of reaching the promised land, God didn't tell them, well, you all just come on in and make yourself comfortable. You made it, and I'm going to feed you breakfast in bed, and all of your enemies are going to see you coming, and they're just going to surrender. You're going to bask in a life of luxury from now on. There's nothing that you will ever want for ever again. God didn't say that, did he? When the children of Israel entered the promised land, it was theirs, but God did not just hand it to them all at once. He didn't allow them to conquer it all at once. Now, because there were so many entrenched enemies in the hills of Canaan, the Jews had to fight for every inch of it. Then they had to fight to keep what they conquered, and it took them many years to fully possess the entire land. Now, the key to Israel's victory was that they showed up to fight when God told them to, and they were living in obedience to what God told them to do. In fact, we read that every time Israel showed up and did what God told them to do, They won the victory every time. Now, it wasn't always easy. It wasn't always fun. And sometimes it was a real struggle. But as long as they showed up and did exactly what God told them to do, they would be victorious. And I believe that is a picture of the sanctified Christian life. There is victory to be had but it will not come easily or quickly. We are in a warfare with spiritual foes who will not easily yield their ground. Now, whether we wish to admit it or not, we will struggle with temptation as long as we live. There is no reprieve from this struggle, and that's one major reason why it takes so long for any of us to get better. You might be wondering, well, then what's the point of being sanctified? Well, the point is, is that the sanctified believer has been given the power of the Holy Spirit. And with that power, they can always defeat Satan every time he or she is tempted. Wouldn't it be nice to know that you will defeat Satan every time he attacks you? then be filled with the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. Yield yourself to him, and you will win every skirmish. Now, please understand, sanctification doesn't keep you out of skirmishes with the devil. But the Spirit of God will give you power to come out victorious in every one of those skirmishes. 
Now, in this important passage out of Galatians chapter 5, Paul is talking about the spiritual, that inner spiritual duel that takes place in the soul of the believer between your old sinful nature and the Holy Spirit. When you become a believer, God forgives you for all the sins that you have committed, and he puts his Holy Spirit in you to give you new desires. The problem is that your old sinful nature isn't too happy about the fact that there's a new sheriff in town. And so rather than just going away peacefully, it puts up a fight. And the result is you and I have dueling natures within us. And we ought to praise God for that war that's going on within. The deadly feud between the flesh and the spirit is one sign that we are children of God. Do you desire to be holy? Do you want to please the Lord? Is there a hunger in your heart to know Jesus and to love him? Do you desire to live a higher and a better life, even though you can't seem to attain it just yet? Well, if you answer yes, that is strong evidence that you are born again. And despite your personal failings, do you truly want to do what God asked you to do? then you may rest in the knowledge that you are a child of God. Your struggle is proof of your divine heritage. If sin is a burden, then at least it's a burden and not a joy. But if you can swear and hate and steal and mock and lust and think all sorts of foul thoughts and speak harsh words, if you can do that and feel no remorse then you are truly without hope in the world. I think that everyone who is listening to me knows what it is like to have a holy ambition. You have the desire to accomplish something good with your life, and you want to change your world for the glory of God, or you want to reach the lost in your family or community for Jesus. You want to be a spiritual leader in your church. You want to be a godly husband or a godly wife. You want to raise your kids to grow up and serve the Lord. And I am sure that all of us have desires along these lines. On the other hand, you find that there are equally strong desires that battle against all of those good things. And the desire to serve others is tempered by the desire to serve yourself. The desire to give sacrificially to missions is countered by the desire for the big screen TV or whatever other extravagant toy you are interested in at the moment. The desire to accomplish something for the glory of God is offset by the desire to build a monument to yourself. See, that is that, inter, that inner uh, spiritual duel. We find that we have a variety of differing desires, and all too often these de desires are diametrically opposed to each other, like wanting to be thin and wanting to eat pizza and ice cream all day. It just doesn't work that way. The real problem is that this duel goes far beyond what you choose to eat. It affects every single area of your life. It affects your marriage. It affects your career. It affects your kids. It affects your church life. It affects everything. You know, over the last few weeks as we have gone through the book of Galatians, we have been talking about how we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. We have been learning that we are saved by grace and not by our own works. But what does that mean? What does being saved by grace mean? Does it mean that I can live, uh, I can sin with total abandon? No. It means that I can totally abandon sin. It doesn't mean that we can be free to sin, but we can be free from sin. 
See, the book of Galatians is a book about victory. You can experience real victory in your showdown with sin. But just like the cowboy in our imaginary duel a few moments ago that we talked about, if you want to win this duel, you must aim to win. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, Let me share with you three principles out of Galatians chapter 5, how to aim to win. I'm going to use the word aim, A-I-M, and I'm going to give you an acrostic and uh, some things that those letters stand for. Here's the first one, letter A, avoid negative influences. Avoid negative influences. Let me read you this newspaper article. According to the Associated Press, on December the 14th, 1960, 1996, a 763-foot grain freighter, the Bright Field, was heading down the Mississippi at New Orleans, Louisiana, when it lost control, veered toward the shore, and crashed into a riverside shopping mall. At the time, the Riverwalk Mall was crowded with some 1,000 shoppers and 116 people were injured. The impact of the freighter demolished parts of the wharf, which is the site of 200 shops and the restaurants, as well as adjoining Hilton Hotel. The ship had lost control at the stretch in the Mississippi that is considered the most dangerous to navigate, and after investigating the accident for a year, the Coast Guard reported that the freighter had lost control because the engine had shut down, and the engine had shut down because of low oil pressure. The oil pressure was low because of a clogged oil filter, and the oil filter was clogged because the ship's crew had failed to maintain the engine properly. Furthermore, this failure was not out of character. According to the lead Coast Guard investigator, the ship's owner and crew had failed to test the ship's equipment and to repair long-standing engine problems. Sudden disasters frequently have been a long history behind them. Now, sudden spiritual disasters oftentimes have a long history as well a long history of failing to filter your influences. You know, if you avoid or you fail to avoid um, negative influences, you are heading for a spiritual shipwreck. If we're going to have any chance at all to win this spiritual showdown with sin, we are going to have to avoid negative influences. Look what Paul has to say about this. Galatians chapter 5 verse 7, he says, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul is saying, you're listening to the wrong crowd. You're allowing the wrong kind of people to influence your spiritual lives. You know, for the Galatians, we have discovered from previous lessons that the negative influences that they were failing to filter or avoid were coming from a group of Jewish believers. These Jewish believers were called Judaizers, and they were legalists. Uh, we would call them um, Pharisees for all intents and purposes. And, and these uh, uh, legalists, they said that you had to add obedience to the Old Testament rules and regulations. You have to add that to faith in Jesus in order to be saved. And the key for them was circumcision, because circumcision represented all the Jewish laws. And for them, it was faith plus works equals salvation. Now, clearly, the Apostle Paul is upset about this, and he isn't pulling any punches with these false teachers. Paul isn't arguing about some minor doctrinal difference, but about the central doctrine of Christianity, 
How is a person saved? Paul says, don't listen to them. Listen to what I say. In verse 10 of Galatians 5, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. He's saying, don't believe as they do. Listen to me and believe as I do. Now, Paul could say that because he was preaching a gospel that had been received by revelation directly from the Lord, which was consistent with the Old Testament scriptures and had been endorsed by the leaders of the Christian church. You need (coughs) to get into the habit of avoiding negative influences. You need to get into the habit of practicing selective hearing. Guys, you know, some of your wives think that you've already got that mastered. I know my wife thinks I have. But who is it that you listen to? I think we all probably have at least one person in our lives who is the voice of the law. And this is some person who happens to be very legalistic about secondary issues. They hold up an impossibly high standard And then they bring your every shortcoming to your attention every chance they get. They are quick to remind you that if you don't do this or you don't do that, then you're not a good Christian. Maybe this voice is the voice of a parent, of a spouse, or of a friend. But we oftentimes make the mistake of projecting that voice Onto God. And so we think that we hear God telling us, prove it, show me, earn it, work for it, then I'll accept you, then I will love you unconditionally. Let me tell you straight out that is not the voice of God. Instead, get into the habit of listening to voices of grace in your life. Now, please understand that the voice of grace doesn't just simply gloss over sin. While on the one hand, the voice of grace isn't shy about calling sin, sin, on the other hand, it's also quick to remind you that God so loved the world, sinners, so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay for their sins. The voice of grace is the voice of encouragement, of comfort, of support. The voice of grace will remind you of the goodness of God and ignite you with a passion for holy living. So learn to listen to the voice of grace and learn to let the voice of the self-righteous, legalistic hypocrites fall on deaf ears. If you're going to win this showdown with sin, then like the cowboy in our opening illustration, you have to aim to win. And aiming to win starts with avoiding negative influences. There's a second habit that you need to get to, and that is the letter I, initiate service to others. Initiate service to others. Paul recognized that people aren't defined so much by their behavior, their profession, their family, their status, but in the end, they are defined by whom they serve. We read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Have you ever noticed how often the Bible connects true spirituality to how we treat other people? One of the reasons why legalists prefer legalism is that it allows them to remain focused on themselves. They prefer this for a couple of reasons. First, it's a whole lot easier. It's a whole lot easier just to keep a few rules than it is to genuinely care about other people and sacrifice personally to meet their needs. 
Another reason that legalism allows them to remain focused on themselves. It's as if they can say, look at me. Look at how wonderful I am. Look at how well I am doing in keeping all these rules. Look at how spiritual I am. The focus of the grace-centered person is always on others. Instead of look at me, it's look at you. And how can I help you? Back in verse 6, Paul tells us that this is a central characteristic of a grace-based life. And we read in verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. What a powerful statement. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. And skipping ahead for a moment to chapter 6, we find Paul saying in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, Whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. That's the New Living Translation. You know, you've heard it said, God helps those who help themselves. And some of you probably think that saying is found in the Bible, but it's not. What Paul is saying to us here is, is that God helps those who helps others. Um, a young boy by the name of James had a desire to be the most famous manufacturer and salesman of cheese in the world. He planned on becoming rich and famous by making and selling cheese, and he began with a little buggy pulled by a pony named Patty. And after making his cheese, he would load his wagon, and he and Patty would drive down the streets of Chicago, and they would sell the cheese. And as the months passed, the young boy began to despair because he wasn't making any money. In spite of his long hours of work and just the hard uh, uh, labor that he was doing, and one day he pulled his pony into a stop, and he began to talk to the, the that pony. He said, Patty, there's something wrong here. We're not doing it right. I'm afraid that we have things turned around and our priorities are not what they should be. Maybe we ought to serve God and place him first in our lives. That boy drove home and he made a covenant that for the rest of his life, he would first serve God, and then he would work as God directed. Many years after this, the boy, now a man, stood as Sunday school superintendent at North Shore Baptist Church in Chicago and said, I would rather be a layman in the North Shore Baptist Church than to head the greatest corporation in America. My first job is serving Jesus. So every time you take a bite of Philadelphia cream cheese, sip a cup of Maxwell House coffee, mix a quart of Kool-Aid, slice up a DiGiorno pizza, cook a pot of macaroni and cheese, spread some gray poupon, stir a bowl of cream of wheat, slurp down some jello, eat the cream out of the middle of an Oreo cookie, or serve some stovetop dressing. Remember a boy, his pony named Patty, and the promise that little James K. Kraft made to serve the Lord and serve as he directed. You know, it's amazing what God can do in and through your life when you make up your mind to put God and others first. But there's a third thing we need to do when we aim to win. Here's the M. Make up your mind to be holy. Make up your mind to be holy. Frank Outlaw said, watch your thoughts. They become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. He's saying that everything you are today is a result of what you were thinking about yesterday. And all that you will be one day 
what you will become will be a result of what and how you are thinking today. So if you want to change your life, you need to start by changing the way you think. If you want to win this showdown with sin, you have to make up your mind to win. You have to make up your mind to be holy. Romans chapter 8 verse 5 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit begins with thinking in the Spirit. Living a holy life begins with thinking holy thoughts. And the same is true with sin. First you think about it, and then you do it. That's the problem with thinking bad thoughts. They don't just stay up there in your brain, but they find a way to work themselves out in your behavior. That's why the Apostle Paul spells out exactly what kind of lifestyle that sinful thinking will lead to. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me tell you another habit we need to get into. We need to get into the habit of thinking about the consequences of our behavior. Let us just for a moment set aside some of the more outlandish sins in that list and look at some others. Paul lists things like jealousy, anger, selfishness, envy, and being hard to get along with as sins that will disqualify you from entrance into the kingdom of God. Now that's some pretty serious stuff there. Now let me also say that just because you get angry once in a while, that doesn't mean that you can't go to heaven. Paul is talking about what happens when you live a life where these things are the rule rather than the exception. However, you can be sure that if your life is characterized by the things in that list, you are in some real spiritual danger. But the good news is that you don't have to stay that way. Just because your sinful nature has won some battles, that doesn't mean that it has to win the war. You can have victory in Jesus. You can win this showdown with sin if you make up your mind to be holy. Because when you focus your thoughts on holy things, those thoughts will translate into holy actions and behavior. Paul says that the following things are the fruit of setting your mind on the things of the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Paul says that when we set our minds on the Holy Spirit, when we make up our minds to be holy and allow him to control our lives, these are the kind of results that we get. Then look at the next verse, verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. You know, we have to say to God, every desire Every thought that I have that isn't pleasing to you, I want to put to death. As you go through each day of your life, you're going to be making decisions and choices. Think about the negative consequences of following your own sinful desires. And then think about the positive results of following the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then choose to nail your sinful desires to the cross. Now, I hope that I have not oversimplified this message because this battle isn't easy. 
But as believers, we do have an unfair advantage. We have the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And we can only win this showdown with sin when we choose to die to our own selfish desire and to live for God and Him alone. If you're going to do that, you've got to aim to win. You need to avoid the negative influences in life that are going to drag you down and lead you in the wrong direction. You need to initiate serving others because God helps those who help others. And you need to make up your mind to be holy because only then can the Holy Spirit's power be unleashed in your life. Because of these things, you can now live your life with the confidence that you will win over sin. And have that confidence, uh, having that will, will change your life. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that each of us would take time to be holy. Father, that we would take time to apply this message to our lives. Father, there's many of us who are at different stages in our life. There are some of us who need to learn to avoid negative influences in our lives. There are people that are dragging us down. There are voices that we should not be listening to, Father. Lord, we just pray that we can avoid those in our lives. And then, Lord, there are some of us that uh, we need to uh, uh, consider uh, time to serve others. We need to start focusing on others. Lord, instead of focusing on self, help us to initiate serving others, Lord. And Father, we need to make up our minds to be holy. Father, help us to think and to do those things that you want us to do. Lord, help us to choose the way of the Spirit and not the way of the flesh. Lord, we ask for your help, for it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining in today. Uh, next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and uh, we are going to take a short break. Uh, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, the next two weeks, we're going to take a, a brief break from the book of Galatians. And uh, so we're not going to pick up the book of Galatians until the week after Easter. And uh, But we hope that you will join us next Sunday as uh, we actually take a look at the uh, uh, Palm Sunday story. So we hope that you'll join us. Uh, don't forget that we are... Uh, just began a new Bible study in uh, the Gospel of Luke. That's on Wednesday nights at 6.30. I hope that you can join us there. Uh, if you miss any of the Bible studies or any of the sermons, you can check those out on Facebook, or you can also go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Uh, you just type in Lebanon First Church of God into the search bar on YouTube, and you should be able to find our channel. If you have a Google account or a Gmail account, you can log into YouTube using your Google account, and you can actually subscribe to our channel. So check that out. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.